So this morning we uh, start a series of what we plan to be uh, probably three sermons on communion. Uh, you might ask why we're we doing this. Well, the reason is um, twofold, really. One is that uh, we are a new work here. We're a new church, um, and we need to have a clear grasp of what the scriptures are teaching on all matters of faith and practice. Uh, in other words, on what we believe and what we do. Uh, we are aware, of course, that uh, there are 2,000 years of church tradition uh, that are out there. And lots of churches have their thing, which they do. Uh, but we ought to uh, start the work here not based on traditions, uh, but based on what the Bible actually says. And so we need to, at all times, go back to the Scriptures and we need to say, uh, what does the Bible teach on whatever subject or whatever issue it may be? Uh, what does the Lord intend for us? to do here and the only way we're going to know that is by going to the scriptures and so we are starting today a pattern of seeking answers in the scriptures whenever we differ on something wherever we have a question on something we come to the bible and we ask the lord what is your word on this so that is why we're doing what we're doing so this morning uh, my uh, aim is to uh, teach what is communion what is it and uh, we're going to start off with a definition. Uh, first of all, when we look at our passage in Luke chapter 29, communion is a remembrance. Uh, the Lord Jesus says in verse 19, uh, this is my body uh, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We come together in the presence of the Lord to take uh, a small piece of bread and to drink wine in specific obedience to his command. Um, the we, of course, being the people for whom Christ died. This is an exclusive meal, not an inclusive meal. Uh, it is for people who have repented of their sins, who have confessed them to God, have given their lives to him as he has given his life uh, for him, and are waiting for his coming or his calling. And the first surprising thing about uh, this passage is that when we think about remembering, um, what the word literally means is to await him. So we are doing this uh, not in remembrance merely of a past thing, but as a uh, feast of remembrance. But, sorry, not just as a feast of remembrance, but uh, much more than that. And so it is a time when we testify as we take the bread and we take the wine that we are waiting for him. This is what the word literally means. Jesus is saying to us, do this while you're waiting for me. Do this while you await my call. Secondly, by way of definition, communion is symbolic. Jesus told them to eat and drink something. It is bread and it is wine. It remains bread and it remains wine. We're not going to examine that in detail this morning, but I mention it because I wonder if you've ever thought it's a strange way to remember someone. How do we remember someone who has died. Uh, this week, I visited my two aunties' uh, gravestones. They were buried together. I took flowers, and my sister cut them into a nice, pretty display and arranged them, and uh, she made a, a good job of it. And we talked about childhood memories whilst we were around uh, the grave. We looked at the gravestone and read the words, and uh, we talked uh, of childhood memories. We remembered them. You might remember them. Uh, your uh, relatives in a similar way or you might uh, perhaps get the photo book out and uh, you know it, not just about people who have gone of course um, but uh, it's a great thing that parents and grandparents do get the photograph album out you know this is what you were like when you were small and, and so on so we can remember in that way if it's a famous person maybe there might be a, a gala evening of some sort where people gather together uh, and uh, remember uh, a person and uh, show clips of their life and so on but Jesus asks us to eat a piece of bread and to share a glass of wine. Has that ever struck you as a surprising thing? Uh, perhaps we're so familiar with it uh, that uh, we forget that. But the reason that Jesus wants us to do that is because these symbols have significance. Uh, and we'll uh, come to that uh, later on. But thirdly, by way of definition, this event of taking bread and wine is called communion. Uh, it's interesting that Jesus doesn't ever call it that. It's never mentioned 
by that in the Gospels, but it is Paul who uh, coins the phrase, as we say. Uh, Paul gives it the name. In 1 Corinthians 10, 16, Paul says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? It, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? And this word communion, as you probably know, is koinonia. And it has a variety of translations. It's used in different ways. Uh, three of the ways that it's used is partnership, uh, such as the, the grace at the end of 2 Corinthians, where we say uh, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship or the partnership or the communion of the Holy Spirit. And so it has that word of working together. Uh, sometimes it's uh, used in a participation of, that you join together to do something. Uh, and another means um, another uh, translation is that of benefaction, something to do you good. Well, all of those things are bound up in the Lord's table, aren't they? Something that we do together uh, in fellowship, in agreement. Uh, something that we do as a reminder of our partnership with the Lord is something that we do uh, that does us good. So when we take communion, then we are doing something important because we are doing something that Jesus has specifically asked us to do. So that's a communion, uh, a definition. Secondly, and briefly, communion is a sacrament. I think we need to mention this. Not that the word sacrament is in the Bible, um, but in the Westminster Confession of Faith, we have these words. Sacraments are holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace, instituted by God to represent Christ and his benefits and to confirm our interest in them or our being part of them. It is a union between the sign and the thing signified. In other words, it's a union between us and Christ uh, as uh, these uh, elements are symbolic. There are two sacraments in the New Testament, uh, baptism and communion. And uh, as one man writes, Jesus starts his ministry with one and he ends it uh, with the other. So what it means then is that we are doing something which is sacred. We are doing something which is holy, which is something which is solemn. It does something for us and to us. And what communion does, it, it brings us into the holy presence of the Lord in a very special way, in a unique way. Okay, I would even go as far as to say uh, it brings us into a special presence of the Lord in a way that the ordinary service on a Sunday doesn't. It is also an act of consecration. It's an act where we give ourselves again to him. As the confession of faith says, we are set apart once again from a common to a holy use. And then thirdly, uh, communion is a covenant sign, a covenant sign. And this is where we're going to spend most of our time this morning. This is extremely important. It is very clear in the passages in Matthew, Mark and Luke that to Jesus, uh, communion is a sign of the new covenant because he says so very cl clearly. He says here, this is the blood of the new covenant. And of course, when, the moment he said that, no doubt the disciples' minds would have been thinking of the words that we know as Exodus 24, 7 to 8, when Moses says to the people of Israel, this is the blood of the covenant. All right, we would now say this is the blood of the old covenant, because Jesus is saying that this blood, this wine that symbolizes my blood, is the blood of the new covenant. But if we're going to understand communion at all, we need to ask ourselves, well, what is a covenant? And what did Jesus mean by this idea of a new covenant? Um, what is communion a sign of? The word covenant translates as a contract. Uh, the word covenant means literally a compact made by passing between pieces of flesh, uh, which might uh, seem a little bit gruesome. But uh, if I read to you from Genesis in chapter 15, we have the illustration of that. Um, with uh, God and Abraham. And in Genesis uh, chapter 15, uh, verse 17, and uh, what has happened here is that uh, God is making a contract uh, with uh, Abraham. And uh, he tells him uh, what this contract will mean. Um, but in uh, verse 17, we read, It came to pass 
when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between these two pieces. In other words, an animal had been slain, had been cut in half, and the Lord passed between the two pieces. On that same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying to this, to, saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates, the land that we now know as Canaan, or that was called then Canaan. So God passed through the midst of the blood of the sacrifice, and God and Abraham were joined together. It was that compact passing through pieces of blood, uh, two pieces of, of uh, meat. But of course, there is much more than, than the covenant with Abraham, isn't there? There was more than one covenant in the Bible. Each one adds something to the previous one. All covenants detail the way that God is going to promise something and that men are going to be obliged to do something. Okay, that's a covenant. God promises to do something. Men are obliged to do something. <coughs> Hang on to that thought for a moment. The other thing we need to say is that all covenants have what is called a federal head. In other words, the man who makes the covenant with God or who God makes the covenant with is afterwards the representative of all the people that take part in that covenant. Okay, so uh, we'll come to that in a moment. The first covenant then was made with Adam. God made a way of having a relationship with Adam, didn't he? Put him in the, he made him a paradise, put him in the paradise, and he gave him a job to do. He said, tend the garden. Okay, look after the world I've made. Okay, rule it well. And there is one thing that you must not do, which is to take of the fruit of the tree of, no, of the knowledge of good and evil. So it's what scholars call a covenant of works. Adam had to do certain things. He had to not to do one particular thing. So his covenant was a covenant of obedience. If Adam had have carried on keeping that covenant, he would have lived. But he failed. And so when we have the words, as in Adam, all die, this is where Adam is our federal head. He is our representative. Because we are under that covenant, we all die. In sinning, Adam broke the covenant, and because he is our federal head and representative, he died, and so do we. But that was not the only covenant. The second covenant that God made was with Noah, wasn't it? Okay, what's the covenant? Uh, you know it in Sunday school. Okay, Genesis chapter 9. This is the sign of the covenant which I made between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my bow in the cloud. It shall be for a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Okay, the waters will never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. And wasn't that a comfort last night when we had the storms overhead and the water pouring down the road uh, and it was just a few minutes, wasn't it? Imagine that for 40 days and 40 nights. God promised well, <laughs> preservation. God promised seasons. God promised life cycles. That covenant is permanent until the world ends. And it remains in force in spite of the continued sin of man. But after the flood, the world was irrevocably different, wasn't it? And then God makes a covenant of promise. With Abraham, he says, leave your country, uh, leave your father's house, leave everything behind, and I will give uh, uh, you a country. I will give you a special land uh, that I have promised to give you. And as we've said already, we've, we've read something of that. It was the land of Canaan. Now we call it the land of Israel. But of course, the book of Joshua is the story of how God fulfilled his promise to Abraham, isn't it? Okay, again and again, that the language of that book reminds us of the promise God made. And then God made a, a covenant with Moses. This was a covenant of redemption. God saved Israel out of slavery, as he promised Abraham he would. So there's a context of one uh, builds on the other. Uh, God commits himself to bless this particular part of Abraham's family. In great detail, as never before or ever again, God gives the law and he tells Moses how they are to live and he also tells them uh, which is interesting if you think about it 
how to atone for when they get it wrong. So God gives the law, he knows they're not going to be able to keep, but he also gives away back uh, to himself. So covenant, so Israel in the Old Testament become the covenant people of God. Okay, uh, They were set apart for God by God. They were different. They were chosen out of all of the tribes of the earth for no other reason that God loved them. So this special relationship that Israel had with God means that they were to meet with him. Okay, That's why you have these feasts and convocations, which are outlined. We've been looking at them uh, in Leviticus or in, in embryonic form. They will can continue. Now these times uh, of convocation, which means rehearsal, um, are specifically and deliberately uh, when the people are to come together, to sacrifice, to meet with God. Okay, this is an important part of the covenant that God makes with Israel. We'll come back to that in a moment. Because God also made a covenant with David, didn't he? Made David a promise. And the promise that he made David is that from his body would come the Messiah, would come the Son of God, the one whose kingdom would be an everlasting kingdom. But lastly, also in the Old Testament, we need to remember this is the Old Testament, God promised a new covenant. Okay, he promised a new covenant in the Old Testament. Okay, clearly the old covenant had always been a temporary covenant. Clearly, also, this covenant had failed, hadn't it? Uh, we had idolatry uh, begun by Solomon of all people, and that uh, idolatry led to the extinction of the kingly line, it led to exile. Okay, as God uh, was angry with his people, the covenant was broken. That covenant of Moses was in ruins. It could never ever be any good again. And so God promised a new one. He promised a new covenant. He promised it to David, in fact. If you look at Psalm 18 and Psalm 132, um, it, is, it is said then that uh, God promised this covenant to David, a, a new uh, kingdom, a new uh, start. It wouldn't just be Israel. And the prophets fleshed these promises out. If you look at Jeremiah 33, Isaiah 9, Ezekiel 37, Jeremiah 31. They're all talking about the new covenant. And it's a new covenant written on our hearts, not written on tablets of stone. It's also going to be a universal covenant. If you have a look at Micah 4, Isaiah 2, Isaiah 56, Haggai 2, uh, Isaiah 11. A lot of these passages we read at Christmas time, don't we? All right, And they're not the only passages. You remember when Jesus is talking to the disciples on the Emmaus Road and then afterwards in the upper room. What is he doing? He's explaining using the law, the prophets and the Psalms or the writings. Uh, and he's explaining all of the things concerning himself, how he is the fulfillment of all of those promises, the promises of the new covenant. In Luke 1, when the angel Gabriel appears to the Virgin Mary, he explains what's going to happen to her in terms of of the fulfilment of the promises the Lord had made in the scriptures, i.e. Uh, what we call the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament scriptures, the new and final covenant is both promised and prefigured. The federal head in each one points to Christ, who is not only the media of the new covenant, but the federal head also, because we read, so in Christ shall all be made alive. So we have a covenant of life, a covenant of uh, of renewal, a covenant of promise, a covenant of redemption, uh, all, uh, and a covenant of the glorious king, all um, prefiguring the new covenant. Okay, That's why it's important to know what Jesus is talking about when he talks about a new covenant. The new covenant is the completion of all of those covenants put together. So when Jesus says to the disciples in the upper room, eat this, drink this, he gives the reason why. This is what the word signify means, by the way. It signifies the new covenant. So communion is that special meeting where the church meet with the Lord to celebrate the new covenant being brought to pass. Ryle comments on this by saying, we stand on holy ground. But you might say, well, that's all very well and good. Why did Jesus introduce communion uh, at the Passover? Why, why did he do that? Uh, because we, we need to uh, understand why he does so. The key feast for Israel was this Passover meal, wasn't it? The Feast of Unleavened Bread, as Luke also calls it. And it's interesting that it's the only occasion that we read of where Jesus takes 
this meal, the Pascha meal, as the Jewish people call it, with his disciples. And it's the one time that he does it, he amplifies it and replaces it. And it's important to us because of what we do at communion. What was the Passover? It was a feast. Not a sumptuous feast. It wasn't, you know, sitting down with a banquet. It was, you know, lamb and bitter herbs and so on. But it was a, a feast whereby they remembered the Lord's great and frankly, unlikely salvation. Remember where they were in Egypt, in bondage to this powerful uh, army, this powerful king. And uh, the Passover celebrates on the night that they were going to be delivered. They killed a lamb. They put its blood uh, on the lintel and on the side posts of the doorway. They sheltered inside the house and they waited until the death of the wrath of God had taken place. And then they ran towards the promised land. So taking the Passover and doing what they were told, sheltering in this house was an act of faith and obedience. It was covenantal and universal because whoever sheltered under that blood would have been safe. I think it's quite clear that if an Egyptian had believed the message and hidden in there, he would have been safe as well. Whoever um, passed under the blood would be safe. But Jesus replaces this meal. And this is why Jesus does the, the first communion at this meal, is because he's saying this is now replaced. This is now over. It's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Okay, we know that. Jesus alone could do that. And so he completes in his death what the Passover points to. He becomes the Passover lamb. He fulfilled the law by obeying it perfectly. And then he offered himself for sinners. He becomes the trespass offering that we read of in Leviticus. He becomes the guilt offering, the substitutionary offering, the peace offering, the burnt offering of total consecration. He becomes the scapegoat outside the camp. He becomes the morning and evening sacrifice of fellowship. Every offering of the law, Jesus was. Every offering of the law, he became, he fulfilled, he completed. So therefore, there is no more need for any sacrifices. They're, they're finished. This is what the new covenant is. Jesus is saying, I am going to die, and in my death, all these sacrifices are complete. Jesus has died, the just for the unjust to bring us to God. He became the curse for us. He took our sin in his body on the tree. He gives us his coat of righteousness to wear in the palace of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is what we celebrate at the communion table. We celebrate the old is gone, the new has come. And there was no better place, was there, for the Lord to introduce communion than at the Passover. And so we might say, okay, well, how is that all uh, relevant to us? We started off by asking, what is communion? Communion, therefore, is a worship meal. Whether we eat together, uh, as appears the early disciples did in Acts 2, before we have communion, well, that's something that uh, we could decide upon. But there are some lessons here from uh, the, these two um, passages of Scripture. First of all, communion is to be a very special occasion. OK, although I do not like this phrase at all, um, it sometimes might be that less really is more. OK, communion, if, if communion ever becomes an irritating bolt on to a service thing that we do, um, you know, nice and rushed so that we can get home before our dinner burns, then we have absolutely no idea what we're doing, do we? OK, it is a very special occasion. It is not something to be rushed through, bolted on, you know, ran through. It is something that we realise is a very special thing. Secondly, we're to realise it's special because in a, in a unique way, as I've said already, communion is a meeting with the Lord himself. Okay, I don't think that this can be overemphasised. I don't want to pinch what Elijah is going to be talking about next week, but you'll notice in uh, Luke's Gospel, Jesus says, with desire, I have desired to meet with you. Okay, And that word is of, of the strongest uh, a type that you can have the strongest desire uh, that's why the, it, it is written in such a way and when we were at the conference a little while ago the preacher stood up and said do you think that desire is any less now than it was okay that's important isn't it we don't tend to think of it like that but Jesus 
wants to meet with us in a special way. That's why he introduced the feast in the first place. And so when we come to communion, it's a meeting with Jesus himself in a special way that he has put in place. It's a meeting of fellowship, it's a meeting of worship, it's a meeting of rededication to the Lord. And we'll look at that a bit more next time. Thirdly, by way of application, we need, uh, I suggest, to spend time preparing for communion. You might say, well, where do you get that from? Well, have a look at these words again in, uh, that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And they make quite sober reading. He says, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Just let that sink down into your mind a little. Okay? If we approach the communion table in a wrong way, in a casual way, in a let's get it over quick way, uh, with unconfessed sin in our hearts and our minds, then we are guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And so what Paul says is, examine yourself. Okay? Let every man examine himself. Okay, so when we're coming to God in communion, we need to prepare ourselves. I don't think that um, you know reading that scriptures out a, a few seconds before we're going to take the bread and wine is really time to examine ourselves. So there needs to be a time, perhaps when we as a as a church together meet to examine ourselves. Paul in two Corinthians thirteen puts it even stronger. He says, "Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves." How do we do that? How do we test ourselves? All right, what does it look like? Well, David perhaps gets close to it in Psalm 139. I'm sure that most of you will know that. But he says, search me, O God. He says, try me, know me, see if there's any wicked way in me. He's asking God to do the testing. Are we walking with him? Are we uh, being obedient to him? Are we countenancing sin in our own lives how is our christian life how is it going with you in your christian walk and so if we're going to take communion then i think we need to spend time preparing properly for it but of course the last thing is uh, who can take communion and the question to that the answer to that question is only christians so can i ask you this morning are you saved are you a christian you see, God has made a covenant uh, in Jesus. He's done something. All right? It's what he does with all the covenants. He does something. But also, he's promised something, isn't he? God says, if you come to me in repentance and sorrow for your sin, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you ask him to be your saviour, you will be saved. That's his covenant promise. And so the only people who can take communion are Christians. People who have come to God and made a profession of faith, who have repented and who have believed in him. And so as we close this morning, can I ask, have you been to Jesus for that cleansing that he only can provide? Have you repented of your sin? Are you sorry for your sin? Have you turned away from your sin? If you are not saved, you dare not take communion. But also if you are living carelessly with sin in your life, you also dare not take communion. Communion is for sinners, yes, but it's for sinners who hate their sin and who runs to Christ as a young child will flee, as we were thinking to its daddy when it knows it's in danger. We need to ponder these passages, particularly these latter half of 1 Corinthians 11. We need to examine ourselves. We need to make sure that we really are uh, the people who should be taking the Lord's table. So this is a very first uh, look at, at communion. It's a bit of a definition one, a base one. We'll go on to expand uh, what this sacrament has to teach us. It's got much more uh, to teach us than we've had a look so far, but this was made to start, and we'll see how we get on with the next two sermons on Sundays. So let's uh, close by...